All right, children. Well, uh, it's great to be back with our family catechism, and we're still on the first question. Um, what is the chief end of man? The chief end of man is to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. Now, in our studies, we've learned a couple of things. That what does it mean to glorify God? And we learned that the answer was twofold. That means there's two parts uh, to the answer. Now, let me read them to you. First, to glorify God means to recognize that He is greater and more valuable and more beautiful than all other things combined. And you will only find peace and satisfaction in Him. That He is absolutely more wonderful, infinitely more wonderful than all other wonders combined. And secondly, to glorify God is to live your life in light of this truth. Now, what does that mean? It means to live your life like you really believe that God is the greatest and the best and the most wonderful and the most beautiful, that in Him alone will you find joy, true joy and satisfaction. Then we uh, went on and we thought, well, how do we uh, glorify God? What are some of the things that we should do? And we glorify God by loving Him. We glorify God uh, by giving Him our reverence our respect, our honor. He's King of kings and Lord of lords. Uh, we glorify God by giving Him all our worship and all our praise. You know, as Christians, we should live a life of worship and praise to God, even when things are going bad, even when it's difficult. Also, we glorify God by living with gratitude and thanksgiving. You know, you're going to learn really quick in this life that you don't always get everything that you want. And you're also going to learn that's a good thing because you don't always need everything you want. But you're going to learn, hopefully, as you walk with God, that um, the more you realize what He's already done for you, especially by creating you, uh, and even in a greater way, by sending His Son to die for you, you'll realize that no matter what you're suffering in this life, you should be thankful because God has saved you through the death and resurrection of His Son. Also, we learn to glorify God by putting our trust in Him, by believing in Him. I mean, you can't glorify God if you doubt what He says, because if you doubt what He says, you're basically doubting His character. And that is one of the worst crimes you can commit. Do not doubt God, because He's never given you or me or anyone else a reason to doubt Him. Also, and finally, we glorify God by giving Him our obedience. You know, to obey is better than to sacrifice. And that we shouldn't be just hearers of the Word, someone who listens and listens, but we should, uh, when we go away, we should do what we have heard. We should be obedient. You know, the, the Christian life is really kind of simple. There's an old song, I'm not sure that uh, many of you young uh, People are familiar with it, but it's trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. The older I get, the more I realize the truth of, uh, of that song. All I need to do is trust and obey Him. Now, how can we learn to put all this in practice? I mean, how can we glorify God? Two questions. How can we learn to esteem Him? How, how can we learn to love Him more? What can we do that it'll make us realize more and more how great He is and cause us to love Him? And then how can we learn to uh, walk in His will? Well, let's take the first question because it's very important. Let me put it this way. Um, how can we make ourselves love God more? You ever thought about that? You know, the preacher is always telling us, and rightfully so, that we need to love God. And maybe you've heard adults talk about how they wished that they loved God more. Well, the question is, how do you make yourself do that? I mean, if you were on the floor, laying on the floor, and you wanted to get up, do you think that you could grab yourself by the belt that's around your waist and pick yourself up? You couldn't, could you? In the same way, can we really make our, ourselves love God more? Can we just be disciplined and kind of clench our teeth and say, I am going to love God more today? 
You know, usually when we do that, we fail, don't we? You know, I'm going to make this happen. So how do you make yourself love God more? Well, here's the answer. The more we seek for God in his word and through prayer, the more we will see how great and valuable he is and how worthy of love that he is. You see, let me give you an example. I'm married to a woman that I love very much. Uh, my wife, her name is Chato. Now, when I first met her, um, I quickly grew to love her. And when we got married, I loved her. But many years have now passed and I love her more. Now, how did I come to the point of loving her more? I love her more because I know more about her. I know more about the good things in her. And those good things that I discover are in her draws my love out of me. Okay? Now, I want you to think about God for a moment. How can you love God more? Well, you can't make yourself do that. But what you can do is you can discover more about the beauty and the power and the loveliness of God. And the more you know about him, the more you will consider him to be worth more than anything on the earth, and the more you will love him. Now, let me try to teach you something that's going to be complicated, but I want you to listen to me. Um, what I've said is true, but you need to understand it properly. And parents, you may have to, may have to help me on this one. Um, the Bible says that every man is born with a, with a depraved or sinful heart. It means that we, come, we are born, we come into this world um, doing wrong. Uh, no one ever had to teach you how to lie. No one ever had to teach you how to be selfish, did they? Uh, your parents have to teach you to be the opposite of those things. And sometimes they have to discipline you to teach you, to reinforce that teaching. Why is it that there's just something in you that, that makes you want to run to wrong things, to bad things? What is it in you that causes you to sin? Well, the first thing I want you to understand is that when you sin, it's your fault. It really is. I mean, I love you. And I want you to be happy, but you need to know something. When you sin, it's your fault and no one else. Now, the problem with a heart, a sinful heart, is this. It doesn't like God very much. Matter of fact, the Bible even says that we were born with hearts that hate God. Now, why would we hate him? Well, the reason why we would hate him is because he's good. And you say... Well, why would we hate a good God? Well, here's the reason. We're not good. You see, we have a heart that likes to do bad things. We have a heart that's very selfish. We have a heart that wants to be in the center of everything. We want everyone to look at us. And uh, we want our way. And everything should be just the opposite. God should have the center of all things. God, God should be the center of all things. And God should have his way done. What God desires is what we ought to do. And so sometimes what God wants and what we want are two different things. And when God tells us to do something we do not want to do, we get angry. Yes, even angry at God. Like when your mother and father may tell you to do something or stop doing something and, and you get a little angry about it. You don't like it because they're telling you to go against something that you want to do. Well, here's the problem. With a heart like that, a sinful heart, the more we see God, uh, the more we won't like him. The more we see of how good he is, the more we will see how bad we are. The more we see how light he is, the more we see how dark our hearts truly are. 
you see. Now, the reason why I'm telling you this is all people are born needing a new heart. You need a new heart. And um, you can't give yourself a new heart. You can't. You can't take out your old one that loves to sin and really doesn't want to submit to God. And you can't put in its place another one that does. But God can. God can. You see, you don't just need to make a decision or change in a few places. Do you know that you need to be recreated? Yes, you do. You need a new heart. And you need to ask God, God, forgive me of my sin and cry out to God that he would give you a new heart, that he would put a right spirit or attitude within you, that he would make you a person who loves him and make you into a person who desires him. Call out to God that he would do for you what you can't do for yourself. There are two things that you can't do, okay? The first one is, you can't pay for your sins. The Bible says that, that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and that the wages of sin is death, eternal separation from God. And you can't remove your sin. Even if you wash yourself with soap and you just can't do it, can a leper change its spots? Absolutely not. Nor can you make yourself clean. But on the cross, Jesus carried all your sin, and when he died, he paid the price for your sin. You can't pay for your sin, but someone has. Jesus has. So trust in him. Like I said in the last lesson, if I die right now, I'm going to heaven. Why? Not because I'm a missionary, but only one reason. Jesus died for my sins, and I trust in him. I don't trust in anything else. I don't trust in Jesus plus me or Jesus plus something else. It's Christ alone. But also you need to realize, not only can you not take away your sin, you can't change yourself, but God can. And how does he do it? Those who have believed in his son, he has done something to them. And uh, I'm going to teach you a big word, okay? You might not understand it, but that's okay. He has regenerated those who believe in his son. That means he has made them into new creatures. And I'm not just talking in a fancy way or, or trying to tell you something that sounds pretty or poetic. I'm talking about something that's real. If any person is in Christ, if anyone believes in Jesus, he becomes a new creature. Now, it doesn't mean that he's a perfect creature. It doesn't mean that he never struggles with sin. But what it means is he really is different. She really is different. Our desires change. You know, before I became a Christian, I didn't want to hear about God at all. And I did not want to do God's will. Are you that way? That's something you need to think about. But one day, someone told me about Jesus. And I began to look in the Bible and, and see, are these things true? I didn't even know why I was so interested in it, but I was. And then one day, I saw that Jesus was the Son of God. And when I saw that, I believed. But not only did I believe, I recognized that something had happened to me. My desires were different. Before, I desired to sin. I desired to do things against God. I didn't even desire God. I didn't care. But after that day, I began to hate the things that I once loved, the bad things I did. And I began to love the things that I didn't care about before, like knowing God and, and helping his people and serving him. So here's what I want you to say. I told you that the way that you can make yourself love God more is to study more about him. And what I'm, I meant that with regard to Christians. If you are a Christian, you truly have believed in Jesus, then the more you know about God, the more you will love him and want to glorify him. So how do we make ourselves love God more? We just learn more about God. And the more that we learn about all the wonderful, lovable things about God, the more we'll love him. 
if we have truly believed in His Son. Now, let me give you a verse that's very important. It's one of my favorite verses in all the Bible. Thus says the Lord, Let not a wise man boast of his wisdom, and let not the mighty man boast of his might. Let not a rich man boast of his riches, but let him who boasts boast of this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord who exercises loving kindness, justice, and righteousness on the earth, for I delight in these things, declares the Lord. That comes from Jeremiah 9, 23 through 24. Now, let's look at what it's saying. It says, first of all, thus says the Lord. Whenever you hear that, children, uh, or you read it in your Bible, it's important. The Bi God wrote the entire Bible, and it's all important. But when you hear God in the Old Testament say, thus says the Lord, or you hear Jesus say, truly, truly, I say to you, then you need to lift your ears up and you need to think, man, this is going to be important. Well, it is. He says, thus says the Lord, let not a wise man boast of his wisdom. Are you very smart? You may be able to do all kinds of stuff like uh, you, you can write very well, you read very well, you do math very well, and maybe even you know a lot of things about the Bible. But the Bible says, let not a wise man boast of his wisdom. Wisdom is not the most important thing, even though it is important. And it says, let not a, the mighty man boast of his might. Maybe you're a young guy and you got muscles and you can do all sorts of things and you play baseball and football and you can run faster than a deer. Well, that's all wonderful, but that's not the most important thing, not at all. And if you think it is, well, let me just tell you, you, you are wrong. You are very wrong. It's not. It's not. So to be the smartest man is not the most important thing. To be the strongest man is not the most important thing. And then it says, let not a rich man boast of his riches. Money is pretty important in this world. Uh, it's probably what most people think about the most. But it's one of the least important things in this world. It is. It can't save you from your sin. It can't make you happy. It can't change you and make you into a better man. Okay? It can get you in a whole lot of trouble, and it can become a God in your life. But rich men are not supposed to boast that they're rich. You know, we hear that somebody's rich in town, and we just ooh and we ah and think, wow, he's a rich man. God says, doesn't mean anything. Okay. So, wise men and strong men and rich men should not boast about those things. So, what should they boast about? But let him who boasts boast of this, that he understands and knows me. The greatest thing that you can know is not a thing. It's a person. It's God. And you know him through the word. And if you truly believe in Jesus and your heart has been changed, the more you know Him, the more you will love Him. Imagine that there was a field and in it was a treasure. And the treasure went on forever and ever down in a cave. And you looked at the first diamond and you thought, wow, that is beautiful. I want to buy this field. But then, you look up and you see another diamond, and it's twice as big as the other one. And you go, wow, I really want to buy this field. And then you keep looking and you look and there's a third diamond and it's three times larger. And you go, wow, that is so beautiful. I want to buy this field. And you just keep going and you see more and more beauty. And it causes you to want the field more and more and more. Well, in the same way. The more you see how wonderful God is, the more you'll want Him. If you've truly believed in Christ and He's changed your heart. He says, He should boast of this, that He understands and knows me. Now, there's something, I <laughs> kind of yawned there, I'm a little tired. There's something that, uh, that I want you to see. You can do all kinds of Bible studies with your parents, and I hope that you do. And I hope you know all about the book of Proverbs, that you understand a lot of things about God. That's important. But you can understand a lot of things about God and not know God. 
You see, even though you're little, if you've trusted in Christ, if you've really come to know Jesus and put your faith in Him, then you have what we call a personal relationship with Him, a friendship. And He can be closer to you than anyone else. He can. And so I don't want you just to know a lot of facts about God, like maybe you do in your history book or when you study math. I want you to know Him as, as you would know a person and then get to know them more and more. Now, many people, you start out and you think, man, I really like them, and then you get to know them, and the more you get to know them, the less that you like them, okay? You think, man, this person isn't what I thought. Well, that's not the case with God. The more you know of Him, the greater and more splendid, more marvelous, more excellent He becomes. All right. Now, He says, Who understands and knows me, that I am the Lord. Hey, uh, listen to me. Can God be your friend? Yes. But never forget, your friend is the creator of the universe. And he is the Lord. He's not someone that you just, you know, treat like you would another friend of yours that's maybe seven years old. He's not someone that you make fun of. He's not someone that you take lightly or tell jokes about. He is the Lord. And you need to honor Him and respect Him and you need to obey Him. Now, here's some things that God tells us about Himself. First of all, He tells us that He exercises loving kindness, justice, and righteousness on the earth. Now, loving kindness, that's a word that um, some dictionaries don't even have it <laughs> um, because it puts together two words, loving and kind. That God is, is love in a way that you and I, even after a thousand years in eternity, uh, He is love in such a way that it's just so beyond us. It's unconditional. It's permanent. He always loves us. And so he's a God of love. That's true. If you've ever heard someone say, well, my God is a God of love. Well, good. God is a God of love. And if he wasn't a God of love, we'd all be in a whole lot of trouble. He is a God of love. But I want you to understand something. He's a God of justice and a God of righteousness. And that presents a problem. You say, why is it so bad that God is righteous, that he's right, that he's good, that he's holy, that he never does anything wrong? Why is it so dangerous that God hates evil and loves good? Well, this is why it's a problem. Remember what we learned? We're not good. So what does a really good God do with somebody like us who's not good? Well, what ought to happen is this. We ought to be judged and we ought to be condemned. Because God is just. But God did something to save us in His love. He sent His Son, Jesus Christ. If you trust in Him as your Lord and Savior, then this just God will pardon all your sins and you will be friends. You will be reconciled. You will be brought together. He will treat you as a son or a daughter. So, God is love, but God is just. Don't forget that. And the only way we can have a relationship with God is by what His Son did for us. Justice cried out that we die. The Son came and died in our place. And by faith in Him, we can have a wonderful relationship with this God and we can know Him. Now, here's something else that I want us to look at. Um, well, before we go on, it says he is a God who exercises loving kindness, justice, and righteousness on the earth. And then he says, for I delight in these things. What do you delight in? What makes you excited? What are you happy about? Well, you can be happy about all kinds of things. I'm happy about sunsets and beautiful rivers and forests and oceans and all kinds of things make me happy. My little boys are happy about Legos. And my little daughter is happy about new dresses. Um, all that is fine. But you need to learn to delight in the things and to love the things that God loves most. First of all, uh, you should love God most. And then you should love the qualities 
that God has, the character, the life that he has. Uh, God is a God of justice. You ought to love justice and delight in it. God is a God of love. You ought to delight when you see love. God is a God of mercy. God is holy, 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 and you ought to delight in holiness. You ought to want to be holy like God is holy. Learn to love the things that God loves. Now, how do we do that? Well, the more we seek for God in his word and through prayer, the more we'll understand his will and the more we'll know how to live according to his will. Now, to, to glorify God is to worship him, have gratitude, to praise him, to want to be with him and to, to uh, pray to him, but it's also doing what he wants. And he wants the best for you, children. It's not like God is commanding you to do all these horrible things that's going to make your life miserable. Not at all. God, his will, his commands are good. They're like honey. They're like light. They're wonderful. They protect us, save us, and give us all kinds of joy. Now, I want to conclude here with, with two verses that are very, very important. The first one is in Psalms 119, 105. The scriptures say, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. All right, now I want you to think about this. And I think we may have used this illustration before, but we'll use it again. Let's say you're in a room and there's all kinds of trap doors in the room, but you don't know where they are. If you step on one, you'll fall straight through or maybe it'll blow up or something. Okay, and you're in the corner of the room and you've got to come all the way across the room but you're so scared. You don't know how to walk through that room. You may step on a trap door and no one will ever see you again. So what do you do? Well, you stand there because you don't have a way out. But if someone gave you a map that told you exactly how to step, how many steps forward, how many steps to the right, a trustworthy map that would bring you all the way through that dangerous room, help you to avoid all those trap doors, then you'd be doing well. Well, you've got something like that. The world is dangerous and it's filled with all kinds of trap doors and bombs and all kinds of things that will really hurt your life. But the Bible, look, look what David says. He says, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. He says, in that dark place, the Bible tells me how to walk and how to live. You need the word of God. You need to study the word of God. Parents, uh, you should be listening to this. You need to study the Word of God and teach the Word of God to your children. Please, this is one of your greatest privileges and responsibilities. You say, well, Brother Paul, I don't know the Bible. Well, then get knowing the Bible. You need to study the Word of God together. All about the Gospel. Also throw some Proverbs in there. And everything else. It should be the, the goal of your home to go through all of the Scriptures before your children leave home. Uh, one of the things that I, I'm trying to do is to work through line by line every verse also of Proverbs each year. That when they leave my home, they've gone through Proverbs quite a bit. But again, um, you teach them the principles, teach them the commands, but you've missed everything unless they see the glories of Christ. He says in Psalms 86, 11, teach me your way, O Lord, and I will walk in your truth unite my heart to fear your name. Now this is very important because we see some things here that's just not about you and me, but it's about God and what we need. It says, teach me your ways, O Lord. You know, the Bible, you need to read it. And uh, it's a pretty clear book. But you need God to help you. And you need to pray, God, teach me your ways. Teach me how you are, who you are what you desire from me. Lord, you teach me because I do not have the ability to teach myself. And he has promised to send us the teacher, which is the Holy Spirit. So we need to pray and ask God to teach us. And he says, and I will walk in your truth. We shouldn't just learn so that we have big heads and we're really smart. The reason why we want God to teach us is so that we will walk in his truth. Remember what James says. It's not enough to be a hearer of the word, but we're also to be doers of the word. So what does it say? Teach me your ways, O Lord. I will walk in your truth. Lord, I'll walk in your truth. Teach me. 
But then he says, unite my heart to fear your name. And he's saying, Lord, if I am going to walk in your commandments, it's going to be because I fear you. But you're going to have to work in my heart so that I learn to fear you. You see, young person, we need to cry out for God to help us because we need his help in everything. God must work in order that we become a Christian. God must work in order for us to grow as Christians. And so one of the things here we see that's so important, it's not just you saying, well, I'm going to study God's word and I'm going to know it. You need to realize that the only way you can know God's word and obey God's word is by God's help in your life, by the spirit of God. And so you are a person who is completely dependent upon God. You need him for everything. I always tell my little boys to breathe in and they breathe in and I tell them to breathe out and they breathe out and I say, who gave you that breath? And they say, God did. And I said, so you cannot even breathe without God's help. You cannot do anything else without God's help. All right. Well, I hope this is has um, has been helpful to you. What we're going to do in our next session is we're going to study what does it mean to enjoy God forever? What does it mean? How do we do that? How does it happen to us? Well, until then, I pray that God will bless you in everything that's according to what he desires for you. God bless you. Bye bye. Please visit our website at heartcrymissionary.com. There you will find information about the ministry, our purpose, beliefs and methodologies, and extensive information about the missionaries we are privileged to serve.